Okay, we're just going to wait a few seconds for the virtual room to fill out and everyone to come online. You won't be a second. I hope you've managed to have some early lunch or planning some late lunch and um, thank you for making the time to join us this morning or this afternoon or wherever you're, wherever you're uh, calling in from. Okay, I think we'll get going and then uh, with the virtual room I'm sure will enlarge as well. So welcome to the fourth online session of the Electricity Storage Network Annual Conference. Uh, my name is Ollie Franklin and I'm the Electricity Storage Network Lead and I am going to be chairing uh, this session. So for those that haven't engaged so far, um, I hope many of you have, but um, this is a part of a whole series of online sessions um, that have happened over the last couple of days. And we also had the in-person conference at the IET on Embankment in London, um, and uh, a couple of our panel members were there, so um, they, they, sh they, sh they were aware of what, what went down. But it's um, just to introduce that very quickly, it was uh, a really good opportunity to, to kind of bring together the industry, see some members face to face. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it's fair to say we're really good buzz in the room, lots of excellent topics. Uh, and a, a brilliant collection of people. So um, thank you for those that made the made the time to to attend. I'll just introduce the Electricity Storage Network as well, very briefly. Um, so we are the voice of the Electricity Storage uh, Network uh, for the electricity storage sector, sorry, in the UK. We have over 60 member organizations now, covering everything from developers to optimizers uh, to asset owners. And uh, we have um, five uh, very active working groups, um, which have kind of um, informed the agenda for today, um, including one on, on, on fire safety. And so that, that's that been the kind of the purpose is to try and um, show some of the work we've been doing and kind of have a really good discussion around it. Uh, and so today is gonna be a panel session. Um, so we, I'll be introducing my panel in just a second. But in terms of how it's going to work in housekeeping, we uh, you have the opportunity to use the Q&A function. So for questions, please do use the Q&A function. And for general discussion points, use the chat. And a, a quick reminder that within the Q&A function, you can uh, like or uprate questions. And that'll be really helpful from, from my perspective as chair to kind of see which the most popular questions um, to ask our, our fantastic panel. And yeah, the chat function, please just use it as a discussion board. So if you've got anything that you're working on that you, you think is, is particularly interesting that relates to fire safety, uh, any links, um, introduce yourself. That's the, that's the, the, the use of the, of the chat function. So please do use that. We will be recording the sessions. So they will all be available free online. Um, and that will be going on to the event webpage. Um, so you should you should have a link in your your emails, or you can just uh, Google uh, the, uh, the Electricity Storage Network Annual Conference 2023, and it will come up. Um, so I think that's it from a housekeeping point of view. Uh, if we just move on, so I just could talk, take a minute or two just to introduce some of the work we've been doing at the Electricity Storage Network around fire safety, and primarily it's been focused in the working group and the Sustainability, Safety, and Supply Chain Working Group. And for the last year or so, we've 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 looked at fire safety as a kind of particular focus area, mainly because there's just been lots of feedback from members and from the industry that it's there's, there's a lot of pressure uh, on on that uh, that aspect that topic at the moment. So um, we've we've tried to kind of yeah, I think that the, what we've been the way we've been approaching it is to kind of try and share best practice. So identify what what is currently happening in in the UK market, try and look abroad into the international uh, scene and, and pull in kind of examples that uh, perhaps other territories are doing something, something slightly better around fire safety and particularly around. So this is, this is when we're talking about fire safety, this is kind of grid scale um, electricity storage here, um, particularly focused around lithium ion, I think it's fair to say. Uh, and 
Yeah, we've been having a, a regular catch up, so quarterly meetings uh, for the last few years on, on, on fire safety and um, some very good discussions around what should be doing and some pulling together some kind of some of the key organizations that are doing really, really good things. And that's the point of this discussion, really, is to to showcase some of those excellent organizations and, and, and really open open up that discussion a bit further. Great. So um, without further ado, I'll try and move on and introduce our panel. Um, so yeah, I've, I've, I'm a, a kind of substitute. So apologies if you look, you are hoping to see Sophie. Sophie's ill. I, I'm substituting in uh, as chair uh, today. Um, so you, you kind of, you've probably got a board of my voice already, as I've done two other sessions yesterday, and I got another one later. But hopefully, uh, I'll be a good substitute for her. So I'll just quickly introduce um, their slides, and then they can introduce themselves in a second. So Julian from um, Fluence, so obviously OEM, doing a lot on fire safety, a really good international view of the market. Uh, Dr. Kai Philip Carries, um, in, in kind of based in Germany, but doing a lot of work across Europe, particularly, uh, and, and in the UK market as well. Uh, Cure. Matt Aldridge, the head of electricity storage at, at BASE, so the Department for Business, Energy, Industrial Strategy, the, the effectively kind of trying to direct the policy around um, health and safety and, and, and electricity storage more generally. And finally, um, Taylor um, from EPRI, um, the Electric Power Research Institute, who uh, are based in the US and have been doing some really excellent work about collating best practice on, on, on fire safety and some, some really interesting research findings. Right, okay. So I think I will ask my panel to introduce themselves, and there's a couple of slides just to help with the introduction as well. So I will go to uh, Dr. Kai Philip Carey's first to just introduce Akir and um, some of the work you guys have been up to. So over to you, Kai. Awesome, thank you. So yeah, my name is Kai. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Acure Battery Intelligence. Uh, <clears throat> I'm an engineer by education, spent the last 14 years in the battery world and had the privilege to lead the largest research group on stationary batteries in Europe for a few years before spinning out to join and found um, a cure. So what we do at a cure is basically um, we're making data that batteries already generate more usable. And we support companies that build, own, or operate battery assets in leveraging that data to make them more safe, more reliable, and more sustainable. So, you know, this is a this is a panel on battery safety, and it's on everyone's mind. We have seen the incidents, you know, Moss Landing just a few months back, but many others before that. And we have found that using data that companies already have, we can substantially reduce the risk of thermal runaway by early prediction by just shutting a system down weeks before something really happens. Um, and the, the nice thing is it, it scales really well. So this is not you know a hypothetical research project, but we're at the moment managing about two gigawatt hours of storage assets, and we're onboarding another gigawatt hour over the next five months. So um, we'll be at three gigawatt hours pretty soon. Uh, a big percentage of that is uh, large scale best um, in Europe, especially in, in the US right now, huge market opportunity. Um, maybe if we can, I think there's one more slide. Let's let's see what, oh yeah, yeah, that, that's just marketing. So we, we, we've been doing that for quite some time. I think there's quite a few interesting uh, uh, examples. I'm, I'm very happy to share them, how it looks in the reality. Um, Looking forward for the discussion. Thanks, Kai. Much appreciated. Um, two gigawatt hours is, is, is quite considerable. Yeah, that's, that's 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 a fair amount of capacity you got, got um, in your portfolio there. Um, Taylor, I'll I'll go to you next, and you just got one slide just to introduce your company and what you guys are up to. Yes, thanks, Ali. Um, hi everyone. I'm Taylor Kelly. Um, I'm a technical leader with uh, Epri. Uh, my background is in lithium ion battery research and development, um, inspections and failure analysis. Um, 
For those of you who are unfamiliar with EPRI, um, we're a independent nonprofit energy research and development organization based in the US. Um, we work on all things um, electricity. Uh, the team that I'm a part of focuses specifically on energy storage. Um, that image on the bottom left, that is our energy storage roadmap that guides our research. Um, and we believe that um, these 15 future states for energy storage can be achieved um, by 2025, fingers crossed. Um, so today's discussion is about safety. Safety is one of the core pillars um, of our energy storage roadmap. Um, we have a dedicated uh, safety research project that is ongoing at EPRI that looks at um, specifically battery energy storage. Um, this, the interest in this research was really sparked after the 2019 Arizona battery energy storage um, explosion. Um, and it became very evident in the industry that um, there was not enough being done about safety. So this research project has happened in two phases. Phase one um, was really trying to um, understand the state of safety. And so the result of phase one was a, um, a fire safety roadmap um, that we developed. It, it, it identified 22 areas um, of research and technology development that we felt should be pursued to further improve safety. Um, it was a nice bubble chart uh, that shows, you know, um, difficulty to achieve along a time uh, and time to achieve access. Um, phase two is looking at that uh, fire safety roadmap and then trying to develop tools that um, in direct response to, to some of the gaps that we had found in, in the industry. So um, on the right side of the slide is just a you know pictorial uh, example of some of the research that we're that we have done. Um, so we've done a battery burn testing to understand what the emissions um, are that come off of a battery when it's in thermal runaway, and this is helping to guide ongoing research right now, understanding um, fire plumes from a battery energy storage fire, um, as well as um, uh, water runoff for um, firefighting. Um, we also have a fire safety design trade study to understand the cost trade-offs of um, putting in safety retrofits. Um, we have an explosion calculator. It takes into account NFPA 68 and 69 calculations. It's kind of a, you know, just rough calculation based on um, the size of your system, um, what sort of venting that you expect, um, and it's looking at fire and explosion um, hazards. Um, we are developing, and I think there may have been a first generation of this, um, I'm not sure exactly how far in development it is, but we're um, developing an augmented reality um, maintenance and safety tool. So. Um, operators can um, use this tool, walk around um, their site and um, use things like thermal imaging to identify if there's a hot module within the container and know not to enter the container. Um, it gives you a, a general reading of what the state of charge is of your battery. Just important information that operators um, should be aware of before trying to enter any, any of these energy storage containers. Um, at the bottom, I have a fire responder, a first responder, sorry, a VR training. That's something that we're hoping to develop. Um, part of our, our research is focused on um, helping to educate first responders um, because, you know, many firefighters have not dealt with a lithium ion battery fire. Um, some of them have unfortunately had to put out either EV fires or best fires, but the large majority of people um, don't know, you know, when they're coming onto a site what is there and what the best practice is in, in, how to, in how to fight the fire. So we're hoping that an immersive kind of training um, tool is something that can help the industry um, with better safety practices. Um, and this is just a flavor of some of the research that we're doing. Uh, storagewiki.epri.com is um, our go-to 
website for um, better understanding all of the research that we're doing. So I highly advise you um, to check it out if you are interested in the work that EPRI is doing. Thanks, Taylor. Um, and I particularly like to highlight the, the VR training. We got a little trial, trial of that, um, which was really interesting to see that the, the, how that would work in practice. And that, that was, education is a massive part of it, right? That's fantastic. Um, Julian, I'll move over to you. Fluence, introduce sure. yourself <laughs> and your role in the sector. Of course, let me, uh, I'll, I'll try to keep it uh, short, short and snappy on this one and then we can move on to the main discussion. So, hi everyone, my name is John Jansen. I'm responsible for strategy, market development and policy at Fluence in the EMEA region. Who's Fluence? Um, Fluence is the largest supplier of energy storage systems globally. We've deployed or are um, currently deploying 5.5 gigawatt of battery energy storage assets um, across, uh, I think it's now more than 30 different markets. We've actually been deploying for our parent um, organization's um, storage systems since 2008, which means we've learned a lot of lessons um, and we understand how to put storage systems in the field, how to operate them in the long term, and how to make sure we maintain both performance and safety to the highest standard. Um, we're, now on our, we're now deploying our sixth generation um, battery energy storage system um, and um, are looking to actively drive standards um, in the industry forward um, because ultimately that's something that benefits all of us um, and it's really critical, I think, for the health of the industry and if we want to deploy more of this very critical technology to meet our energy transition goals. So that's really the role we are trying to take. Um, we look to be the best in class leader on safety. And it's really inherent to us as an organization. Um, it is a fundamental policy principle in this organization um, is that safety is very much on top of the agenda um, across um, everywhere from design to installation to operation and services of the system. Thanks, Julian. That's great. Thanks, thanks for having me along. Um, Matt from BASE, yeah, introduce yourself. And well, we, we, we know your role, but it'd be great, great to hear more <laughs> from you. Yeah, no, um, yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. Yeah, so Matt Aldridge, uh, head of electricity uh, storage policy in Bayes. So uh, I am responsible for um, all scales of storage. So that's, all, that's, that's the domestic batteries, way up to um, uh, not for today's topic, but like the pumped hydro storage. So obviously that's that's got a huge um, array, but. Uh, the health and safety issues are there extant through, throughout all of them. Now, my goal in Bayes, we've we came up with uh, back in two, uh, 2021, the smart systems and flexibility plan to try and make a smarter, more flexible energy system to get to net zero. Um, and we're all about trying to find the barriers, removing the barriers to allow the market to come in and fill that gap to create that net zero energy system going forward. Um, that's all well and good, but if we don't do that in a way that is uh, safe, then we'll end up undermining the case for it. And there's quite a few policy interactions, which I'm, I'm keen to discuss later because it gets quite complex. Because um, although I sit in bays, whenever I talk about health and safety, I actually spend a lot of time talking to planners in DLUC. Um, I talk to uh, people in HSE, so the health and safety executive, um, uh, and people in the home office. So it becomes quite a complex network of government where everyone's trying to protect consumers as well as um, create the conditions for the market to, to, to bloom. So we're quite clear we're going to need lots more electricity storage, and that means lots more batteries and lithium-ion batteries across the country. We can't undermine the case for it by not doing this in a, in a way that, where the regulation is, is, is safe going forward. So um, our approach is very much trying to work with, with you guys, work with industry to come up with the appropriate responses as we go forward. Um, so thanks very much for, for having us here today and I'm looking forward to the discussions going forward. Great. <clears throat> thanks, Matt. Um, comprehensive introduction and a quick reminder to add your questions to the Q&A um, and a reminder to kind of upvote those that you think are, are most interesting and I will, will thread those through into the discussion wherever possible. So I think maybe just a quick introductory question again off the back of that really is, is, is where do we think the current state of best practice is in terms of fire safety and we've, we've got a bit of an international flavor here but I'm, i'll probably try and hone it a little bit into the kind of uk market and then pull in international examples if that's okay um so i suppose maybe if i come to you julian because you've got a 
pretty good view of of some of the different moving parts and obviously i think you guys are pretty active in ireland as well they're doing quite a lot there in terms of best practice if i come to you first julian uh, and then we'll introduce the rest of the uh, the panel as well so julian sure can do i think you know ultimately we have to recognize that we're not dealing with a completely new novel technology right i think we have to recognize that batteries and the use are widespread, right? We've got 8.7 million EVs and, and plug-in hybrids across the world. And we've got almost 5 billion mobile phones, probably got over 12 gigawatt hours of best um, operational um, across the world. So we're not dealing with a completely new technology. Of course, the, the specific technologies and, and use cases vary quite significantly across those, but we are dealing with a known technology, but we're just dealing with the scale up of a more or a more novel application here. I think that's a really critical piece to always highlight when we talk about in particular battery safety. Um, the point that I think for me is critical to look at right now is that I think in the UK, we have a real lack of clear standards um, and guidelines. Of course, there's some um, guidelines out there. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean we, we're sitting there calling for UK specific standards or UK specific regulation because there's actually a lot that we can learn from international standards, international regulation. If we look at, for example, now UL 9548 testing in the US as a really important example on how um, storage systems deal with thermal runaway and deal with um, explosions or fire events within the system, then that's something that we should say is applicable for the UK as it is for any other global market, really. Um, I do think, however, there is a big gap and a need for the industry to move forward and really be forward leaning and provide guidelines on what should be considered best practices and what should be considered best practices from a whole system approach, all the way from the very first point around testing and system design, all the way to operation and end of life and um, and also first responder training, which we'll see um, Taylor really highlighted nicely um, earlier in her introduction already. So looking at that and being forward leaning as an industry and come forward with what we consider best practice is to me the only way that we can continue to scale and to ensure that the technology we use in the field as we scale up is safe for operation and we don't risk alienating the communities where these assets are being built. Thanks, Julian. That's a, yeah, a lot of good points there. I'll come to Kai next, if that's okay. And obviously you've got very much a data focus to best practice, I suppose, but yeah, anything you want to add? <clears throat> Well, well, first of all, um, I, I can only second what Julian just said. I think that it really hits, you know, the nail on the head. And we, one thing that in, in all of us that are working in energy storage or in batteries, we're used to extreme growth rates because that's our daily business. But if you just take two steps back and you look at what's actually happening right now, like the the speed at which we're ramping up production around the world, the speed at which we're bringing new technologies, be it silicon anodes or new, you know, cathode flavors into the market, it's mind boggling. And one problem or one challenge of scale really is, uh, if you have a failure rate of five in a million, that's mm -hmm. mostly okay for most applications. But if you start to build a hundred billion of these types, five in a million is too many. So with increasing scale, the production quality must improve dramatically because otherwise the absolute failure numbers become unacceptable. And it's not just, you know, battery production quality, but also, you know, companies like Fluence and others, they grow extremely fast. It's difficult to have you know, at all times, highly qualified people staffed into these companies and everyone's struggling with that. So really just because of the fast growth of this industry, we are looking at systematic problems that affect safety. And one great example, I, I believe, where we can all learn a lot from is this is not the first time that a new technology scales fast. If you just look at solar in the early 2000s, the exact same thing happened. You know, many of those companies that started solar in the 2000s, they're no longer around because something happened that, you know, killed the company. Uh, you had fires, you had early failures, you had insane warranty claims. 
30 years, <laughs> you know, three years later, that company was no longer around. And I think we can learn a lot from solar. And speaking about the data perspective, also one thing that we saw is that, you know, today there's no commercially operated solar uh, installation without an asset management uh, software. The same goes for wind. If an asset is so expensive, you want to know if it's working and if it's safe. And I think that batteries are in this phase of professionalizing and that we'll see much more of that in the next years. Thanks, Kai. Um, I'll come to you, Matt, next, if that's OK, because obviously you've got a very, very much focus on on, on the UK GB, mar GB market. Um, and I, I think James in the chat mentioned there's an IET there's Code of Practice uh, version three due to be coming out in 2023. And I, I know there's, there's stuff ongoing in terms of the, the Bayes Health and Safety Governance Group. Yeah, what, what are your thoughts in terms of pulling together that best practice and standards that Julian mentioned and things like that? So this is the thing, and I think, uh, you know, I think I can't remember what your question was right at the beginning. It was like, like how are we doing relative to the rest of the world sort of thing and regulations? And uh, yeah, we, the, there's regulation there uh, and it's in lots of different places and I think pulling it together is the key is the key thing and having a systematic way of learning from um, from events around the world and inputting them into the way that we manage our regulation here is what's is what's important um yes it's not new technology it's a new application of technology and it's being scaled up um when it comes to regulation, that basically means it's new and it's coming at us in a way that um, we find it difficult to keep up with. The world of regulation isn't fast. Um, you know, uh, lots of people in industry like to run fast and break things. And I think um, I heard someone say that government's job is to run slow and put things back together. Um, it's this, 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 we need to make sure we get it right, because if we get it wrong, we will do more harm to the industry in the long term. Um, and I understand how that can be frustrating to lots of people in the industry. But if you look at world leaders on applying these technologies and smart systems across their grids around the world, and I'm thinking of Australia, and I'm thinking of the US, um, and, um, and I'm thinking of Europe, uh, with there or thereabouts, we're all learning at the same pace, I think. So in answer to your original question, I think, I think we're there, and I think we can do better. Um, and I think a lot of the hard work's been done. It's just a case of pulling it all together into, you know, into a way that's consumable for people to understand and learn from going forward. Thanks, Matt. That's really helpful. And um, maybe I'll come to you, Taylor, now in terms of, yeah, how do you how do you see the, the kind of best practice coming through? And obviously you guys are doing a, a really good job in, in collating that into kind of a database, particularly around incidents and transparency and th those kind of kind of issues come up all the time in the discussions as well. Anything you want to mention there, Taylor? Um, this is a very broad a broad question. Uh, so uh, best practice, I think, plays into um, the entire life cycle of the, the asset, right? So um, from procurement, design, um, implementation, O&M, um, response if there is a failure, and then decommissioning. And everybody who's involved in each of those different parts of the project are likely only involved in their part of the project. They might not be involved in every single step. And so um, this kind of goes back to, to education. Um, and unfortunately, we learn by doing. Um, there's only so much that we can learn from reading papers. Um, we can say, theoretically, this should be safe. Um, and then in practice, something fails and it's catastrophic. Um, and the, the goal is to try and minimize those, or at least if there is a catastrophic failure, we can do it in a safe manner, in a controlled manner. Um, and um, this is where education comes in through the entire um, kind of life cycle of, of the system. So from design, you know, understanding um, what sort of mitigating equipment can be um, introduced into the system to try and control a fire, um, when it comes to O and M, what sort of equipment do people need to be wearing? Um, what do they need to be aware of when they're entering into a container? Um, when it comes to a failure, you know, who are the people that need to be um, on call? What are the first responders doing? Do, are they trained? Um, do they understand how to enter how to enter the premises? Um, so. Uh, 
yeah, there, there are multiple facets of best practices, um, but understanding kind of the fundamentals of um, why a battery would fail and what the failure looks like can help to inform each of those steps along the process and help to develop best practices based on that. Thanks, Taylor. Maybe a kind of follow up to that. And there was a question in in the Q and A regarding first responders and, and fire safety. Then, so and maybe Matt and Julian have points on this as well. Is regarding so how how do you think first responders in the UK or in other jurisdictions are doing? Because I think we've we've had discussions in the working group regarding first responders, and I think the problem in the, in the UK or the GB is there's each fire service is quite distinct um, and they have different practices and things like that. So is, yeah, is there any kind of particular issues you're seeing with educating first responders and getting those kind of best practices within the first responder community, let's say? If I come to Matt first. Yeah, I, so I, I, I'll, I'll jump in to defend the, the, the fire brigade of the UK there. It's like, yes, it's, 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 it's quite fragmented in the way it's organised, but um, you know the way they're approaching it and working with us and trying to learn, I think at the minute, it, it is it is is better than that, is much more joined up. Um, so the fire uh, chiefs council are certainly leading on um, trying to understand uh, the ways in which we can best um, best plan and prevent in uh, incidents in the way that you know when it comes to the planning of of these sites to ensure that they have the right access the right water supply and uh, the right markings are all there so that they're very much leading on this um and they're actually um uh, uh looking into um, best practice across the fire services uh, in the UK at the minute on how to approach these incidents. So they're definitely alert to it. Um, and um, I think, you know, through groups like the Health and Safety Governance Group, we hope to bring together industry alongside the fire services so they can talk to each other because the fire services are obviously experts in putting out fires, but they're not experts in batteries. And you need to bring the two, the two together. So um, hopefully we're facilitating that. Um, going forward so yeah i think i think they're approaching it well i mean how well that goes down and as we've been talking about the speed of the proliferation and like you said at the beginning we're talking a lot about grid sites here um but i think what what worries a lot of fire you know and i can't speak for the fire services but from talking to them what i think worries them a lot isn't necessarily the big industrial sites which are well labeled and things like this it's actually um scooters and uh, electric cars and things in people's homes which are not as well regulated not as well installed and um can have significant consequences in that way great thanks matt that's very helpful and uh, good defense of the fire service apologies for that um uh kai i'll come to you because I, I think you've done a fair bit of work in identifying causes and particularly that angle at the end there around domestic smaller scale uh, risk associated there have you got any thoughts on that yeah, so, um, you know, it, it's a big part of what we do as a company to analyze the operational data of batteries in all sorts of applications. A big part is BESS, but also domestic storage, automotive, commercial vehicles. And, you know, so just to, 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 to get everyone on the same page, every battery has a BMS, you know, that continuously checks voltage, current and temperature. And that data in most cases today already is accessible through a cloud, uh, certainly for all uh, best projects, but also for domestic storage and for automotive. And by you know looking into that data and applying some physics-based models, some machine learning, you can actually dig deeper into what's going on inside of the battery. And in terms of safety, that is um, extremely helpful because you know the the most of the safety measures that we apply today are reactive or passive like passive is i'm just going to put more space between containers <laughs> so if i lose one i don't lose another and reactive mechanisms could be my bms shuts down when the temperature goes above 60 degrees celsius or 50 degrees celsius but by the time it has reached that temperature you know, shutting off the system in most cases won't help you anymore. And so the question is really, can we go from 
passive and reactive to predictive that would allow us to stop the operation before something happens. And coming to your question is in order to do that, you need to find, you need to know what to look for, <laughs> right? So what we're basically doing, and I think what, you know, also some, some companies are doing in-house is, can we identify internal processes of the battery that are highly correlated with safety, safety relevant topics? And I'm just gonna give you one example. I think that's for, for people that have worked with batteries a, a, a little bit is, um, it's, it's quick to explain lithium plating, right? Lithium plating is when you charge a battery and the lithium ions, they want to go into the anode uh, and basically park there, but for whatever reason they can't, so they just plate onto the anode. So metallic lithium forms outside of the anode instead of going into it. And that metallic lithium is highly problematic. Metallic lithium, you know, it's very reactive. It forms razor sharp dendrites that can, you know, damage the battery itself. And from looking into how the voltage and current of the battery change relative to the 10,000 other batteries in this site, you can actually see, oh, you know, 9,000 cells are going that way. And this one cell is going the other way. And we know that this is critical. And there's still a lot of untapped potential uh, that we see that you know, can be applied to systems, even retrofitted really easily because the data is already there. But of course, you know, data analytics cannot replace high production quality, cannot replace UL testing and all these other, you know, fun things. It's just one additional layer. Just to follow up and actually taking in a question from the Q&A is we've got, what, what do you see the differences between stationary storage versus electric vehicles? Because I know you do both. Um, are, are there any particular kind of data requirements or, or differences mm -hmm. between those two? So actually the differences we see in battery data inside of an industry are as big as they are across industries. So if you're looking at large scale storage, we've seen everything from sub-second data to one minute data although most systems now are in the two to five second range because they need to interact for trading in that frequency. frequency. So there, there are some quasi standards, um, but the quality of the data, it varies a lot from the major best operators uh, like Fluent and like others, we've seen fairly uh, good data, but what we have seen also is that unless companies ask for this data proactively and maybe put it already into the tender or into any documentation pre-sales, they might have a hard time to get it later. So, you know, my, my small advice is make, make sure you, you have access to the data from the very beginning, you know, whether you want to do it yourself or work with someone else, it's just, it's valuable. Great. Thanks, guys. That is nice and clear. Um, I'll have another question for the Q and A then, if, if um, that's okay for the panel. It was regarding: Is there a likelihood for regulations uh, to be introduced regarding a locational criteria for energy storage? Um, so I suppose that's <clears throat> that's the risk, right? So if if we start getting the kind of exclusion zones for for kind of developments and things like that, does anyone have a view on on whether that is a kind of likelihood, a risk? Um, I suppose I might come to Julian first and then to Matt and then Taylor. Yeah, th thanks, Ali. I think, I mean, not too specifically on, on, on the exclusion list, but one thing we have to ask ourselves, I mean, one, I don't actually think that's the right way to go down in terms of determining that from the very top down. The other thing we have to really ask ourselves is where's a lot of location of value for these battery storage assets, which is often actually in demand centers or around demand centers versus where maybe you don't want to build it, right? So there's a big question we have to ask ourselves, where is battery storage actually solving a lot of problems, um, even though you may say you don't want um, a site nearby? We're actually looking at California. A lot of these assets, very large gas, oh, gas peaking replacement assets are being built in urban areas. And you know what? People are pretty happy because they have clean air. They don't have a fossil-based fired power plant around the corner polluting the air anymore. So actually for them, it's a much bigger improvement. Now, of course, there may be certain considerations to take, in particular, obviously, around 
um, nature reserves, any protected areas, um, of course, that is a consideration. But we have to really think about it clearly. Is an exclusion zone actually counterproductive to what we want to achieve? Secondly, I think it's also really critical to take people on that journey. If these sites are, right, I mean, Taylor mentioned this earlier around the whole system approach, all the way from planning to end of life, mitigation alongside training of fire um, services in the local area. If the site is installed properly, designed properly, um, all mitigation and training measures are taken, then the risk to local communities is very, very limited. Um, and in that case, I don't see the need to drive exclusion zones based on whatever measure um, they may be going to follow. I think what's more critical is to make sure that the way it's installed is done properly, you know, and that just doesn't just touch up on the electricals, but it touches up on the civils, make sure that, you know, you have the right fencing around the site, et cetera, et cetera, right? That comes into it. So making sure you have the right installation, making sure you have the right training mitigation plans with the local fire services, make sure they're trained from the very start of this project to know exactly what's happening, exactly how they should be responding. Um, and then making also very clear what is happening with that site at the end of its life and finding the right parameters around those areas. And actually, I think industry has to drive a lot of that forward based on the experience we've gathered, rather than coming down with top-down determined exclusion zones that may be somewhat arbitrary and counterproductive to what we're trying to achieve with these sites. Thanks, Julian. Very clear. Matt, do you want to comment? Yeah, I do, um, because I agree with everything Julian just said. Um, uh, but I do, but I do want to say there's there's a potential risk here, um, not, uh, and that is with the public not understanding. Um, so we've just like everyone in this room understands the risks, and we're all con comfortable with the risks, uh, and we all think the risks are minimal, and we all believe we can mitigate them, uh, which is great. Um, it doesn't take long for a tiny bit of hysteria um, to uh, infect the way people perceive new technology, and that can really hold us back. So I guess my plea, as someone who works in public policy, is for industry to understand that the more open and the more progressive that we can be about this and actually get ahead of it by putting in and almost voluntarily restricting ourselves and putting in mitigations we will win over the public who are the people that we're going to have to like you say like locate these sites in urban areas where they're best required and they can best dispatch when you know in the right time in the right place um but it's about winning that over and i think we don't exist in a bubble um uh, uh, like I have political masters that I interact with all the time. Um, it, it almost doesn't matter how pro a minister is or anti a minister is, they also have parliament and they have their own constituents. So we don't exist in this wonderful technology bubble where we can just push it forward. We have to understand that we are providing services for consumers and they need to be convinced that this is, that this is safe. Um, so we all have a job of work to do uh, there to, uh, to make sure that the public understand exactly what what these technologies are and what they're capable of. But actually, just to add on that, Matt, sorry for, Ollie, for, for interrupting, but I yeah. think just an important point. At the same time, it, like, I agree with you and I agree industry has a responsibility and we have to move that forward and we have to take people on journey. So 100% align, align with you on that. At the same time, we have investment signals, the way storage is currently earning money, that is encouraging a pure race to the bottom. And that's encouraging technology to come in from new suppliers with no track record, very little software capability, not really caring about the safety of these assets. And to a certain extent, you know, if the asset makes money, maybe it, it does matter to um, some of the, the, you know, some of those suppliers. So the question is, if we're driving incentives in one way that is driving actually low cost, low cost, low cost, because that's the only way to make the investment case pencil, that is a counter intuitive incentive if we're trying to at the same time get people to from the start think about safety build projects properly and engage with local communities on top of that no, I, I think it's a fair point julian and i think there's a lot of new entrants to the market as well and as, as ty mentioned so much growth it's it's a challenge to avoid that race to the bottom which you've you've seen in other other industries for sure Taylor, I'll bring you in here as well. So is there anything you, you'd like to kind of highlight in this area in terms of, yeah, from, from what from Matt and Julian have been talking about there? Yeah, um, I, I agree with both of, with what they've said. Um, this is a complex kind of um, problem. So 
this is where um, in the US, the, the AHJ or the authority having jurisdiction plays a key role because they will determine um, what codes or standards that the energy system needs to abide by um, when it is getting put into the ground. And so, um, and what the AHJ um, requires will vary across jurisdictions. So if you have a rural environment, they might not know a lot. There's a lot of open space. They might not really care. Put it in, let it burn. If it if it goes up, it's fine. Um, but when you're dealing with urban communities and you have a lot of people around, uh, there's extra care that they need to consider and should be taken to make sure that um, people's safety is is thought of and incorporated into the system design. Um, and with that, I will say community buy-in is so important. These days, everybody's a YouTube professor. Everybody knows everything about everything, right? Um, and um, I, I was talking to a firefighter and he said, oh, you know, thermal runaway always leads to fire because it makes oxygen. It makes its own oxygen to burn, which is partially true, but not enough oxygen to you know, create a fire and explode. And so there, there's little bits of truth in the things that people have heard and grabbed onto, but it's, it's nuanced. And, batteries are complex and the failure mechanism is equally as complex. Um, and so being, I think um, we have found that being proactive in community engagement and going to community leaders, especially in underserved communities, right? Where they feel like they're being overlooked and, and overseen, um, being proactive, going to those communities, talking to leaders, explaining what the project is and how it's going to improve their quality of life, explain that this is not, you know, we are taking the safety measures um, that you are concerned about and, and making sure that these systems are not going to pose a threat to you. And we have this all planned out. And that is very important in order to get rapid deployment, um, I think, in an agreeable fashion and not just like forcing it you know, onto the grid. Great, thanks Taylor. Um, Ali, go, sorry. may I jump in? Go just for it. One, uh, because I think we now had, uh, I think a really great overview about, you know, the, the key stakeholders that we have here. It's the industry, it's the regulators, and it's the communities. But I think there's one stakeholder missing that actually sits kind of in the middle of all them, and that's insurance groups. You know, the traditional way to hatch against technology risk is to get an insurance. And most of, you know, especially in the best space, uh, these are all, you know, project-based financing. So you have a bank loan that needs to be somehow um, uh, hatched with an insurance, at least like a property damage insurance, most projects. And uh, we've been working with insurance groups regarding property damage since the day we started this company. So uh, for almost three years, we've been working with them and we partnered with a few. And these, you know, they, they face the same challenge, but they actually need, they're an outside party that needs to bet on the safety of a certain system and on the risk of that. And so they are having such a hard time. And although people, you know, you want to assume that there's these big mathematical models in the background, and they have an exact answer for the risk? No. <laughs> so you can see insurance rates skyrocketing after each individual fire. Although you, you have to say, well, statistically it happens once in a while. Why should the insurance rate be more higher the week after? Because they're, they're humans. And I think there's a big gap between the speed at which the industry develops and sometimes even communities and you know the all the stakeholders that have an interest in, in getting these things developed and insurance groups that are basically like, maybe I'm not insuring any of those anymore. We've seen companies completely go out of it because they said, we don't know, we can't evaluate the risk. And I think this is one point you know, where data comes in really handy to bring transparency into this process and to give also insurance groups the opportunity to say, well, if you have all the red flags and still you do nothing about it, you can't point the finger at me for paying, you know, whatever happens then. And so I think this could be one enabler also to bring costs down because the insurance costs for storage, Julian knows this much better than I do, have gone up substantially 
for for many projects. Very good point, Kai. I think yeah, insurance has been definitely a, a big pointer in, in some of the working group discussions we've had, and the role insurance is, is playing in, in driving, I suppose, more focus on fire safety, um, particularly if, the, as you say, the prices have gone up so much. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll widen the question a little bit then in terms of, which we, ha we do have a question there around kind of visibility, clarity, uh, and then maybe kind of summarize it by transparency and uh, the question from Andres is regarding OEMs, but I think maybe I'll widen it to be, what can we do as an industry to be more transparent around um, incidents, um, best practice, data, you know, all, all those kind of things. And maybe if I start with Taylor, because I know you guys have got like a, an incident report uh, as such or on, on your wiki page, is that right? In terms of like an international incident report? Yes. Um, so uh, transparency is key. Um, and we we try to make um, a lot of our safety research, uh, at least the you know high level general learnings um, public. And we're working to do that more and more. So we do have a battery um, energy storage uh, failure incident database. You can find it on that storage wiki page. Um, and it we are tracking um, battery failure events uh, globally. And um, I think that people that I've interacted with have found that to be hugely helpful um, because when we're only working in one area, we tend to have our blinders on and we're only focused in that one area. And then we see how big the problem is. And like Korea has had a number of fires, but that's not something that we see in our news daily, right? Um, and that helps to show that this is not a isolated problem. Um, this is a global problem. And to, to Kai's point, you know, scale up. And a lot of the, a lot of this manufacturing is happening in China, in Korea. Um, and so getting that visibility is is so important and to um one thing that i just want to say is I, I like the panel that we have here it's a lot of very diverse backgrounds but um, i think data is such an important piece because data transcends any you know local ideas or jurisdictions or regulations that we have um, the data is the same across the board the battery only charges to you know four point something volts and only discharges to however many volts. Um, we can only use it so many ways. Um, so if we have that data, regardless of where the battery has been and we can understand how it's been used, we can um, more quantitatively you know, bet on this technology being very successful. We can understand how to safely um, and properly use it in other applications. Um, so that, that visibility is important for the life cycle of the battery, um, as well as safety, um, just projects generally. And it, having, having more transparency, I think, is key, and it's something that we're really, really missing um, as an industry. Thanks, Taylor. That's, that's good. Um, maybe I'll come to you next, Julian, and then we might widen it as well in terms of so transparency, obviously very important. And then if you've got a kind of a specific ask um, as we kind of running towards the end of time, is there any kind of specific ask that you think the industry should be working on? And if that from the electricity storage network point of view or, or, or wider than that, are there any, is there anything that that we really need to be working more on? We've covered a lot of areas, but trying to kind of condense that down. Yeah, actually, um, it's nice I can combine both into a single answer, hopefully. So I'm not sure it should work well. I, I mean, look, I agree about transparency. I think it's really important. Um, we have to be open um, as much as we can. We have to take people on that journey with us. And I think for that, you know, if we take, make it around specifics and tangibles, we as um, the Electricity Storage Network, um, but also in particular the, the working group, um, I think we have to really take a more forward-leaning posture um, develop some clear best practices, right? Those are not binding regulation, but best practices, which everyone should as much as possible adhere towards. Um, but it's also something we can then share with local communities, with planners, with policymakers, um, with fire services. So they understand this is what the best practice looks like. Um, and they can take that to whoever is building a site and say, this is what we want to hold or the standard we want you to adhere to or hold up against. And that is, I think, a really critical point because it touches up on transparency, but it also means we're forward leaning as an industry. We take people on that journey um, and we really communicate what we believe is as best practice. And there's a great example. Um, we're just doing that actually in Ireland with Energy Storage Ireland. 
um, doing exactly that exercise that's ended up being um, a very, very long document, which was intended to be a short, concise, snappy um, document, but actually it's really critical. And we've engaged in Energy Storage Island, we've engaged with the fire services. So actually we had webinars with the fire chiefs across the Republic and Northern Ireland, because again, it's very critical to help them understand it and dispel myths. And again, the same can be done in the UK. There's great fire departments. Let's take them on a journey with us. Let's help educate them. Let's answer their questions open and transparently. We can have you know, Chatham House Rules webinars where we have those discussions and we bring different experts to the table. So my call would really be to foster that transparency, to foster better standards, to allow us to scale. Let's develop some clear uh, best practices and let's communicate with the people for whom these matters the most. Thank you, Lynn. Very helpful. And yeah, any storage island doing great things. We'll, we'll try and emulate them as, as much as possible. Uh, electricity storage network in the, in the UK. Um, uh, Matt, uh, I'll, I'll come to you next. Obviously, very much front and centre for you, for you guys. And you've got the kind of the existing health and safety governance group. Is there anything kind of asks that you have um, from, from us in the industry as well? Or just yeah, I, I guess I sort of just repeat what I said earlier. So I agree with everything that Julian said, and, and, and you know, we, we actually do have quite a good relationship. But we're going to have a busy year coming coming up. Um, there is there is um, uh, a private member's bill to do with battery safety that's going through at the minute with Maria Miller. So I do ask that everyone is aware of that, that like i said that political dimension which um i know we can be dismissive of because we can think oh that's just fear mongering or they just don't understand um we need to engage with with these legislators and um uh, these lawmakers because they have a they have a huge effect and they will direct policy and if we're not careful we'll end up uh, being pushed down um down routes which not only do we not want but are unnecessary and will 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 harm the industry going forward in the future. So it's that um, we've all said it today. So uh, you know, don't to labour on about it too much. But it's that whole knowledge dispels fear and um, being open and reaching out to communities. And it's you know, it's a little bit of understanding where the risks are, but also really selling what this technology does because you know it just looks like batteries. And I don't think people really understand how important they are to get into net zero really um so it, it's that whole bit thanks matt that's that's clear kai um wrapping up thoughts as we are rapidly running out of time uh, any any particular ask that you'd focus on i'm guessing it will be around data <laughs> uh well actually i i would say i have two pop topics one is uh like me in my role as coming from a battery data company related and one more broadly towards the industry and you know all the things that we're discussing now are based on an insane growth of the entire industry. That is, if you look at the next 10 years at the very beginning of the curve, right? All of our goals for 2030, all of our electrification goals, directly or indirectly mean that the energy storage industry will grow about 30% year over year. That's scary. <laughs> because it feels like everyone is already maxed out, <laughs> you know, in terms of their attention span, in terms of what they can do. So we have a lot of stuff coming. And so I believe finding a good base that's scalable, right? To cope with all these new things. Now, sodium, sulf uh, sodium ions are coming. You know, the industry had shifted with within two years from, uh, NMC-based cathodes to mostly LFP for stationary applications. Ten years ago, or even seven, eight years ago, LFP was dead. Like people said, oh, you know, scaling effects of NMC, they're going to, you know, take the whole market. No, they didn't. Two years later, completely different technology. Deal with it. SOC calculation doesn't work. We're still building them. And so there's, you know, there's a lot of topics that where I believe we need to find scalability to to just be able to to juggle all of these balls so if everyone's you know doing their own thing it won't work just from a matter of scale specifically when it comes to data i would say we don't need standards but best practices so what julian said i i totally echo that it's enough if the willing can agree on a certain range of things we should do when it comes to data you know I think we're in the process. We are bilaterally working with many of the storage companies, but maybe it would be time to do something 
more public maybe later this year. But once we have interoperability, also for the project developers, if I have five different projects with five different data sets, ah, it's not efficient, yeah. right? So in terms of scalability, we need a little bit more um, best practices or standards, but I think we're working on it. So this, this, this panel gives me hope. Work in progress. I like that. Maybe that's, that's, that's a reasonably uh, good message to, to end on. Um, plenty to be getting stuck in with. I'll just, um, we are out of time, unfortunately. So I, I think we could carry on talking about this for, for a little while longer. Um, but I'll just get the slides back up so I can just yeah, give you a quick outro uh, in terms of what, what, we else, what else we have coming up. So just a reminder, um, Electricity Storage Network is a membership organization. If you're not a member, please do join. Um, it's, it's very inexpensive and you get fantastic value. Um, so you, I'm, I'm your for kind of main contact. Please do, please do uh, drop me an email um, and the details will be uh, sent to you via email as well. And we have um, lots of working groups. So that, that's that's the main value you get from your membership. And the, obviously the one covering fire safety is on the bottom there, the sustainability, safety and supply chain. Uh, our next meeting's in, in, in kind of 21st of March. But we've also got a whole other host of other stuff to kind of get to grips with and, and for you to get um, along to. And finally, um, just a kind of very quick thank you to all of our sponsors. Uh, sorry, no, no, we'll go, we'll go back to one more. I have one more session for you uh, later on this afternoon on grid connections, um, the, the kind of key topic in the sector at the moment, uh, apart from fire safety, which we've just covered. Um, so uh, uh, hopefully some of you will be logging on to that. And a very final thank you to our sponsors. So Road Knight Taylor, which we'll be hearing from at three o'clock. Um, Fluence, Julian uh, and others, thank you very much for sponsoring. Schneider Electric, uh, Ethical Power Connections, Ampex. And uh, I just um, say thank you very much to our wonderful panel for taking the time out to have a, a discussion with us today and see you all again soon at some point. Thanks all. Thank you, Ollie. Thanks. Cheers, thank guys. you. Thank you.